The Christian Complete Armor by William Grinnell. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Chapter 13, containing the first cause of roving thoughts and prayer. But you will ask, what counsel can you give to arm us against both these excursions of Satan and wonderings of our own vain hearts in prayer? Impossible indeed it is, wholly to prevent them. They come so suddenly and secretly, even as lightning in at the window. We may as well keep the wind out of the house, which gets in at every crevice, though the doors be shut. At holy free our hearts from their disturbance. Yet this will not exempt us from taking the utmost care to hinder the prevalency of them. Humors, while rolling here and there, do not endanger us so much as when they gather to the head and settle in some part of the body. I have read of some place where such multitudes of locusts are seen that they almost darken the air as they fly and devour every green thing where they alight. The inhabitants, therefore, when they perceive this army hovering over them by making fires in the fields, keep them from alighting with the smoke. Thou canst not hinder these roaring thoughts from flying now and then over thy head, but surely thou mayest do something that may prevent their settling, towards which take these directions, which I shall endeavor to suit to those several causes from whence they proceed. Section 1. The first cause, and original of all other, is the natural vanity and levity of our minds, which are as inconsistent as quicksilver. They are as unstable as water, which element diffuses itself hither and thither, and so is soon drunk up and lost. Thus do our vain minds scatter themselves, but never so much as when we are conversant about spiritual duties. Then, above all, we discover the lightness of our spirits, and this is not the least part of that evil which followeth men's, man's degeneracy, who by his fall wounded both head and heart. Now, though there be a cure in part made by the grace of God, as to both these in a saint, yet there still remains a weakness in his soul, whereby he is not able to dwell long upon spiritual things without some dissipation of thoughts as innocent Adam could, who, before his fall, might have walked through the whole world, and not have had one thought of his heart in place, or turned from its right point by the diversity of objects he met, they being all to the eye of his soul a clear medium through which it passed to terminate itself in God, as the air is now to our bodily eye, through which it pierces and stays not till it comes at the body of the sun. But alas, it is with us as with one that hath had his skull broke by some dangerous fall, who, when recovered, finds his brain so weakened that when he goes about any serious business he cannot do much or persist long. Such vagaries do our hearts take in duty, and this gives Satan advantage enough to work upon us. If the ship be light for want of ballast, and strong gusts of wind arises, oh, how hard, then, it is to make it sail trim or keep it from turning over. A vain heart and a strong temptation together may make sad work when God stands by and gives Satan leave to practice upon it. Be therefore careful to take in thy ballast before thou puttest to sea, and labor to pose thy heart before thou goest to pray, which that thou mayest do. Section 2. Endure thyself to holy thoughts in thy ordinary course. The best way to keep vessels from leaking is to let them stand full. The vain heart out of prayer will be little better in prayer. The more familiar thou makest holy thoughts and savory discourse to thee in thy constant walking, the more seasoned thou wilt find thy heart for this duty. A scholar, by often thinking of his notions when alone, and talking of them with his colleagues, make them his own, so that when he is put upon any exercise, they are at hand and come fresh into his head, 
whereas another for want of their this attention makes matter of his thoughts to feed on, which makes him struggle to hit it off that which suits his occasion. The carnal liberty which we give our hearts in our ordinary walking makes our thoughts more unruly and unsuitable for the duties of the worship. For such thoughts and words leave a tenure upon the spirit, and so prevent the soul from making a better appearance when it returns into the presence of God. Walk in the company of sinful thoughts all the day, and thou wilt hardly shut the door upon them when thou goest into thy closet. Thou hast taught them to be bold. They will now plead acquaintance with thee, and crowd in after thee, like little children, who, if you play with them, will cry after you when you be rid of their company. Section 3. Possess thy heart with a reverence all of God's majesty and holiness. This will gird up the loins of thy mind and make thee mind what thou art about. Darest not trifle with the divine majesty in his worship. Carry thyself childishly before the living God to look with one eye upon him and with the other upon a lust and to speak one word to God and two with the world. Does not thy heart tremble at this? So pray as if thou wert art taken up and presented before God, sitting on his royal throne on high, with millions and millions of his glorious servants ministering upon him in heaven. Certainly the face of such a court would all be. If thou wert but a at the bar before a judge, and hast a glass of a quarter, for an hour's length turned up, being all the time thou hast allowed thee to improve the begging of thy life, now forfeited and condemned, wouldst thou spare any of this little time to gaze about the court, to see what clothes this man hath on, and what lace another wears? God shame us for our folly in misspending our praying sessions. Is it not thy life thou art begging at God's hands, and that a better I throw? with the male factor sues for of the mortal judge, and dost thou not know whether thou shalt not have so long as a quarter of an hour allowed thee when thou art kneeling down, and yet will thou scribble and dash it out to no purpose upon impertinency? If thou believest not God to be so great and glorious, why dost thou pray? If thou dost, why no better? Why art thou not more close and compact in thy thoughts. Will God judge us for every idle word that is spoken in our house and work? And shall thy idle words in prayer not be accounted for? And are not those, those words idle that come from a lazy, sleepy heart and mind not what it says? What procured Nabon and Abiah so sudden and strange a death? Was it not their strange insect? And is not this strange praying when thy mind is a stranger to what thy lips utter? Behave thyself thus to thy prince if thou darest. Let thy hand reach a petition to him, and thy eye look, or thy tongue talk to another. Would he not command this madman to be taken from before him? Have I need of madmen that you brought this fellow into my presence, say Achish, when David himself behaved discomposedly? First Samuel 21.15 Or could you but look through the veil and see how glorious angels in heaven serve their Maker, and who are said to behold the face of God continually, surely you would tremble to think of slightly performing this duty. Thirdly, go not in thy own strength in this duty, but commit thyself by faith to the conduct of the Spirit of God. God hath promised to prepare or establish as the word is, the heart. Indeed, then the heart is prepared when established and fixed. A shaking hand could as soon write straight as our loose hearts keep themselves steady in duty. Shouldest thou with Job make a covenant with thy eye, and resolve to shut up thy ear from all by discourse, how long wouldest thou be true to thyself, who hath so little command of thy own thoughts? Thy best way here is to put thyself out of thine own hands, and lay thy weight up on him who is able to bear thee better than thy own legs. Pray with David, Uphold me, Lord, with thy free spirit. Psalms 51.12 The vine, leaning on a wall, preserves itself and its fruit, 
whose own weight else would soon lay in at the dirt. End of chapter 13